Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Would you stand up with me? We're going to read a little bit from Psalm 103 together, uh, three verses. So they'll be up on the screen. Read them with me. Bless the Lord, O ye his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And I will sing um, a version of, of those words. I'll lift your voice in. is slow to anger when I go astray. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, for all of my betrayals, he will not leave me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, through mercy and compassion, his great love is proved. Covers my transgressions like the snow. As far as east from west, all my sins removed. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And he saved me from the pit. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. From endless springs of kindness, all his blessings flow. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Our days will fade like flowers and our quickly spent. And like the wind, our years will come and go. Everlasting favor is his covenant. Bless the Lord, oh my Merciful and gracious is my God to me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And I will tell his goodness through eternity. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, bless the Lord, you angels, all you Every living creature here below. Praise the Father, praise the Son, and Holy Ghost. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, bless the Lord, you angels, all you heavenly hosts, and every living creature here below. Father, praise the Son and Holy Ghost. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Amen.
In tenderness, she sought me. Weary and sick with sin. And on his shoulders brought me back to his fold again. While angels and his presence say, until the courts of heaven rain, oh, the love that saw. I'll daily pawn and sing anew his praise with all adoring wonder his blessings I retrace it seems as if eternal days are far too short to sing his praise oh, the love that inside me oh, oh, the blood that bought me oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God the grace that brought me me oh the blood that bought me and oh the grace that brought me to the fold of God grace that brought me to the fold of God amen Joey's gonna come play I'm sorry Joey I really just <laughs> said it for him Okay, some, some verses to prepare our hearts for corporate prayer this morning. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? <clears throat> Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation, O Christ our God. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, for I quickly want it. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, O Psalm 16. Bring joy to your servant, Lord. For I put my trust in you at Psalm 36. The joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah 8. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, Romans 13. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter 
various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, that endurance suffers and that suffers. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we ask that you would help us today to acknowledge our daily need for gospel renewal and restored joy. We join the chorus of many who cry, revive us again. Since your joy is our strength, Father, fill up our hearts afresh with your joy. The joy that fills the courts of heaven. The joy that fills the hearts of angels as they see your plan unfolding in the world. Holy Spirit, since joy is one of the fruits that you are growing in our lives, reveal to us where our hearts are out of step with our grace-given identity in Jesus. Reveal to us where our joy is being sapped away. Our struggles with unbelief, the temporary insanity of thinking the gospel isn't enough. Our tendency to look for joy apart from Jesus. Jesus, since you are praying for the fullness of your joy to be in us, we will live with anticipation and hope because your prayers never fail. Awaken and sustain our hope in you. Help us to see and savor that all that you are for us is better than all the world. Lord, sustain our joy in you amidst the trials that each of us will face. Sustain us with an endurance producing joy. Sustain us with a love for one another kind of joy. And may our love for you, Jesus, and our love for each other make you irresistibly attractive to a watching world. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Oh, Lord, my rock and my Greatest treasure of my longings for My God, like you there is no other True delight is found in you alone Your grace, a well too deep to fathom your love exceeds the heaven's reach. Your truth, a fount of perfect wisdom. May I escape in my unending. Strong defender of my weary heart, my sword to fight the cruel deceiver, and my shield against his hateful darts, and my song when enemies surround. Tides of sorrows rise, my joy when trust. Gracious Savior of my ruined life, my guilt and cross laid on your shoulders, in my place you suffered, bled, and died. You rose the grave and death I conquered, and you broke of sin and shame, you rose the grave and death I conquered, and you broke my bonds of sin and shame, oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, may all my days bring glory to you.
Father, we thank you for our calling us together today to be your people. And thank you for giving us a heart that desires to worship you. Uh, help us now to do that. Um, as we have in song now, uh, let us turn our attention to your word. Uh, let us be drawn closer to you by the power of your word. So thank you. We love you. It's in all Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, look around. Greet your neighbor. Fourth and fifth graders, head to Kids Corner. So if you're looking for a way to serve this summer, Kid Zone, sign up, I think, is right out there on the table. I thought I saw a picture. I got a picture of it in my mind. It's like right out there. Sign up. Good morning. You know who you are? The much-loved people of God, right? I don't know what your week was like, but I'm sure that message was challenged. And I want to remind you again that you are held with a love that will never let you go. In Jesus, you're his forever loved love. Okay? Just want to always check that, make sure that's, that's the deal. My name is Stu. I, right? Yep. And uh, I have the privilege of being the pastor for the interim here. And I hope you're praying because things are going to start kind of moving along in this. And I hope, I hope you're just praying every day uh, that God will just send us the leader that, uh, that we need for this time in our life at Faith Community Church. So, All right, if you have a copy of the Bible, I want to turn to John chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. And we're, again, we're in a series where we're looking at different pictures in the Bible about who Jesus is. We want to see that, we want to savor that, you know, let it kind of move around in our hearts and minds, and then we want to talk about how we can share that truth with others. So, John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, the words of, of Jesus, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So again, I want to uh, call you to pray now. Pray silently right where you're sitting and, and uh, ask God to speak to you. Tell him you're listening. Ask him to speak. If that's a new thing, go ahead and do it. You pray silently, then I'll pray, 
And we'll take a look at the image of Jesus that's contained uh, in this scripture. Let's pray. Father, we live um, by the words you speak to us. They are food for our soul, our, our minds, our hearts, our wills. So again, today, we ask that you speak for your glory and for our joy. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. One way that I define discipleship, this life of following Jesus, is this way. Learn to live with Jesus and learn from Jesus how to live. That's really good, and it's not original to me. That's why it's so good. I, I took that from uh, a guy named Dallas Willard who's been saying that, was saying that for years and years and years. He's with Jesus now. The word disciple means student. So by definition, a disciple learns from whoever they're following, uh, from whoever they've apprenticed themselves to, learn from Jesus how to live. But Christian discipleship has more to it than the important doctrines that Jesus wants us to learn. It has more to it than the important values that Jesus wants us to incorporate into his, our day-to-day -day lives. In addition to these great values and this important doctrine and truth, our discipleship to Jesus includes sharing our life with his, his life with ours. In fact, this sharing of life between Jesus and his disciples is the most important thing about discipleship. That's why I like this statement from Professor Willard so much. Learn to live with Jesus and learn from Jesus how to live. And this shared life, Dr. Willard didn't just make that up. He, he saw it in the teachings of Jesus. Leading up to the scripture we just read, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to make our home with him. Our home, God says, will be with him or her, the person who follows as a disciple. And so the point is obvious that Jesus is making, that Jesus' disciples will share life with him. And again, please note that this is a distinctive of Christianity. Our faith isn't something that's simply directed toward God, nor is our faith uh, uh, simply about things we affirm about God. Faith in Jesus results in a personal experience of Jesus himself sharing his life with us. I'm sorry. Maybe I didn't say that right, because I thought you might have come out of your seats. <laughs> Let me try it this way. The God who spoke all creation into existence. The God who took on flesh and healed people with a word. The God who stilled the storms with a command and walked on water and shattered the bonds of death. That God has made his home with us. Are we all Norwegian or what's the deal? I know you're Dutch. Come on. <laughs> That's all I got. And Jesus spoke that truth to his first disciples when he was explaining to them that he was about to leave them and go back to heaven. And the events of the next 
few days were unimaginable to them, that he would die on a cross, be raised from the dead, ascend into heaven, and yet after all of that, he said, they would share life together. In fact, he said it was going to be better than what they had been experiencing in those three years of walking around with him on the planet. How? In this, in this same upper room conversation, he taught them about that too, and he said, I will ask the Father, he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. So let's stack all this together and try to stay seated, okay? Just try to, con- tr- just, you know, because you're in church, you wouldn't want to be emotional, okay? Let's try to hold it together. Being a disciple of Jesus includes obeying his teaching and experiencing life with him through his indwelling presence. Thank you. And both of those things can happen because even though Jesus has physically returned to heaven, the Holy Spirit has come to fill his disciples. And that's why Dallas Willard, with all emotion, says, learn to live with Jesus and learn from Jesus how to live. Now, when we move from John chapter 14 with all that fun stuff to John chapter 15, we find that Jesus gives us an image that helps us understand what that shared life with Jesus is like. And the image is that of a vine, uh, Jesus, and the branches growing out of the vine, us, his disciples. And so that image portrays this vital union of a branch and a vine, life throwing through the vine to the branch to bear fruit, to share life, a life union. A few of us, maybe, have familiarity with vineyards. Some of you could have used a little bit of the vine, the fruit of the vine this morning to maybe invigorate you, I don't know. But vineyards we have less familiarity with. In the first century, it was obviously a very familiar image, just like we would be familiar with apples on trees and ears on corn stalks. They knew about vineyards and all that stuff. But the image in the first century carried more than just information about grapes. Israel, Jesus' nation, was God's vine. That's the way they're talked about in the Old Testament. God's vineyard, God's vine. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You, God, cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its boughs to the sea. It shoots as far as the river. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one has a vineyard on fertile hillside. He dug it up, cleared it of stones, planted it with the choices of vines. Imagery of the Old Testament that Israel was God's vine, his vineyard. In fact, they say, scholars, that the entrance to the temple was even decorated with a gold vine reminding them that Israel was God's people bearing the fruit of God's life and truth. The trouble with many of those Old Testament references about Israel being the vine in the vineyard was that they're typically found in the context of failure. So let's go back to Psalm 80 and Isaiah 5 and finish this image out. O Lord God Almighty, how long will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Israel, God's vine, God's vineyard, when Jesus uses that image, his disciples certainly knew what he was talking about. Historically, uh, most Jews would know that. And, And they would know, even though they would seldom admit it, that as a nation, they were oftentimes uh, failures at bearing the fruit that God expected them to bear. A little bit of review. All of the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's what God promised Abraham, the patriarch of Israel, 
that God would bless him, God would make him a great nation, and through that nation, Israel, all the peoples on the, world, on the earth would be blessed with knowledge of the one true God and his ways and all that stuff. And for most of their history, when God looked for good grapes among his people, he found bad fruit. Most of the time, idol worship, covenant unfaithfulness, spiritual arrogance and isolationism, forsaking the poor and the foreigner, teaching more law than grace is the reason for the relationship with God. And that sad history is also part of the context for this image that Jesus is using. And, and, and the disciples knew that. God's vineyard, and yet we don't have a great record of bearing fruit that shows the beauty and glory of who God is. And so then, with all of that, Jesus says to them, I am the true vine. Just think of the weight of that. You vineyard people, I am the true vine. What Israel had failed at time and time again, Jesus would fulfill. He is God's truest planting. He is taking Israel's place as the means of God's blessing for all the nations of the world. It's quite a statement. I am the true vine. The true knowledge of God, the true experience of God's life would be found in Abraham's greatest descendant of all, Jesus. I am the true vine. And he says it that way intentionally and on purpose. He is making a claim that he is more than some man, right? We're familiar with this. He is claiming to be God when he says that, I am. On seven occasions in the Gospel of John, Jesus intentionally uses those words to, the, to disclose his true identity that he is God in the flesh. They date back those words to a set of a sacred history dating back to the time of Moses. Moses is a fugitive murderer and he's out in the desert hiding out and God speaks to him by means of a bush that doesn't, be, that doesn't burn up and, and Moses eventually kind of comes around to saying, well, what's your name? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And so if a name represents the character of a person, which it often does in biblical stories, what we learn from God about his name is that he is. What's your name? I is. <laughs> I am. I always was. I always will be. I am eternal. I am infinite. I am, I am never ending and never beginning. It's a verb of being. This is my name. I am. And Jesus, each time he uses that I am reference, is making that incredible claim. I am the eternal, infinite God. I am the true vine. I am the truest revelation of the truth about God, his character, his values. And when you share life with me, you share life with God. Now in this illustration, this analogy in John 15, Jesus speaks about God the Father as the gardener. He's the farmer who prunes and cuts off the branches of the vine. And the point of all that is to, to reinforce the truth that when a person's life is connected to Jesus, it will bear the fruit of a life revealed to God. And God will be intimately, intricately involved in that person's life. Okay, again, this is part of the claim that Jesus is making, that I'm fulfilling all that God has promised. God is going to work in people through me to make their life fruit fruitful. Jesus says, I'm the key now. I'm the key to everything. Uh, sometimes when, when good-hearted, uh, true Christians read John 15, they might doubt. 
that they're okay with God. Some Christians read that and go, I wonder if I'm about to be burned up. Um, And maybe they're in a tough season of their life spiritually. Maybe they're struggling with a habitual sin and they and they see that there's a lack of fruit and they look at these verses and and they begin to doubt their relationship with God. They're like, man, I maybe I'm in trouble after all. I remember thinking that as a new believer the first time I read this. I went to my youth leader and I said, am I in trouble here? Because sometimes I see my life not being so fruitful. Am I done for? Especially verses 2 and 6, right? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, the Father, takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Well, as was explained to me then and a thousand times since, (laughs) that if you read John chapter 15 and come away fearing that you may lose your salvation, you have read this incorrectly. Okay, so let me tell you a couple reasons why I say that. First of all, It pushes the analogy that Jesus is using beyond its intention. The main theme of this illustration is that an intimate connection to Jesus, who is God's true vine, fruit-producing vine, produces fruit. Jesus is making a claim here that He is essential, that His is the life-giving presence. And he's drawing attention to that truth that he is the one who fulfills all of God's promises and intentions for his people. And if anybody wants to be in God's vineyard connected to God, it's through him. It's no longer Israel. Jesus is the center of God's work on the planet. And if you're not connected to him, then maybe you are in trouble. That's the big idea of all this, this analogy he uses. Second, the context, I think, of the entire Bible and even the definition of eternal life itself teaches that once a person has life in Jesus, they have that life forever. Earlier in John's Gospel, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. In that verse, Jesus talks about two present realities for a person of faith and one future reality of a person with faith. Presently, the person with faith in Jesus, he says it here, has eternal life and has crossed over from death to life. Present realities and the future reality they will not be condemned. And that is a pretty powerful statement. No figures of speech in that. That's a pretty powerful statement that Jesus is saying that when you are saved and rescued by him and reconciled to God, it is a done deal. It is forever secure. The word eternal in itself would suggest that, that you've been given eternal life, never-ending life, not life until next Tuesday when you sin, (laughs) and then you lose it. See, that would be Tuesday life. That wouldn't be eternal life. Jesus says it's, it's eternal. Jesus adds to that theme of assurance of salvation when he says also in John's gospel, for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Again, that verse speaks of a present reality. You shall have this eternal life, and a future reality raised up by Jesus. And that adds up to the assurance that when Jesus rescues you, reconciles you, it's a done deal. It's eternal. It's forever. It's not next Tuesday life. It's eternal life. And I could quote many verses about that, about the security of those who have been saved by God's grace in Jesus. Secure because God does the saving. 
secure because everything about our salvation has to do with the behavior or performance of God and not us. And the point I want to make just by quoting those two verses from the Gospel of John is that the Bible doesn't contradict itself. So here's an interpretive rule for us as we read the Bible together. If we come, uh, let's say it this way, when, there's a, when, there's a, when we come upon a, a, a verse that seems to contradict what we think is a very clear uh, biblical teaching, when at first glance that verse seems to contradict that, then we need to take a second look. <laughs> and the second look here tells us that Jesus is giving this analogy. He's making this claim about himself, about being the true vine, and life is found in connection with him. And apart from him, there is no life. It's Jesus now. It's not Israel. It's, 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 nothing, it's nothing but Jesus that connects you to God. And so uh, you can't push his analogy beyond its intention. Secure, held with him forever. And Jesus, again, is talking about sharing a life with him. The truest vine, God himself, connecting with God through him. And, and Jesus fulfills now how all of the blessings of God will come into the, the nations of the world and the way to connect with God is no longer, again, through the nation of Israel who failed, but through Jesus who, who never failed. And if you had thought um, that you were just automatically connected to God, Jesus would say, no, you need to think about that. It's not your nationality. It's not your heritage. It's me. It's me. Jesus. A life connected to him is like the branch connected to the true vine. That's what he's talking about. It's, the, again, one of the distinctives of Christianity, that our faith is not just about something, but our faith is an experience of someone who says, I will make my home with you. One of the greatest homegrown uh, philosophers, theologians, America's greatest homegrown guy, Jonathan Edwards, wrote this. For in the heart where Christ savingly is, there he lives and exerts himself after the power of the endless life that he received at his resurrection. He makes his home with you and exerts a power like that which can raise people from the dead. When the apostles talked about that, especially Paul, and they talked about that amazing truth, they used this language, in Christ. 164 times Paul uses those words to describe this relationship that we have by faith with Jesus. We are in Christ. We have a life that's shared with his, in union with him. Jesus' life has entered ours by the Holy Spirit to give us this life-altering connection and experience of God's life in ours. For he chose us in him, Jesus, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. That was part of God's plan before we even existed. That this salvation would include this connection, <laughs> this union, this oneness with the life of God through Jesus, a branch connected to the true vine. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come inseparably connected to Jesus in him, giving us a brand new 
way of living, a brand new kind of life. One old theologian said, union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. Salvation doesn't just do something for us. It does something to us. It unites us to this amazing God of the universe, a shared life, branch connected to the vine, God making his home with us. And we are to see that and savor it like the most amazing thing you have ever taken a piece of. That this God of the universe has joined his life to yours. I have more to say, but I just want to stop there for a moment (laughs) because that is worth savoring. Like a branch to a vine in joined union shared life. The God of the universe. Learn to live with Jesus and learn from Jesus how to live. Well, what can we share about that amazing truth? Uh, First of all, again, to those we are discipling, mentoring, trying to help follow Jesus. And and I'll say it again, Jesus calls each one of us to that, to go and make disciples of all nations. This maybe looks different for some than others, but we've all got a part to play in that. And I think one very basic part that we play in that is to invest in the people around us to help them learn to live with Jesus and learn from Jesus how to live. Could be in your house, your family. Could be in your small group. It could be others that you know here at Faith Community Church. We've all got something that we can say into the life of someone else about learning to live with Jesus and learning from Jesus how to live. The whole women's ministry thing is structured about that women who have walked with Jesus a while, pouring into the lives of women who are younger. And so again, I would say if you have never have, start looking around and ask God, who? God, who do you want me to invest in? To invite to follow me as I follow Jesus. That's what Paul said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So what can we share about this Jesus, the true vine? Let's start with this amazing truth that Jesus is not out there somewhere. His life is in us, joined to us who believe. You know how sometimes we think that? That we're all alone? That God is just... He's not. He has joined His life to yours. And so let's teach others that amazing Christian truth from Scripture and from examples of our own lives that Jesus is right here and we can draw on His life for all that we go through. Let's teach people to pray like that with desperation and to open the spigot and say, here I am, fill me, Jesus. You're exactly who and what I need right now. Jesus, please fill me. Let's teach people to to listen for his voice in the scriptures. To read the Bible, listening. Jesus, speak to me. I know because you're right here. Speak to me. I want to hear you when I read the scriptures. Let's teach people to read with that kind of experiential expectation and desire. He's with us. His voice is real. His strength is real. His presence is real. Let's remind those that we disciple uh, with Scripture and examples from our own lives that fruitful, productive, meaningful lives come as we live out of our connection to Jesus. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. 
Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So not only is Jesus' life and power and presence available to us, joined to ours in our salvation, that's the only way that we're supposed to try to live in this world. Drawing from that. We had this image at the village church that we used of, of working out of rest, of abiding and then serving, of drawing near to Jesus, spending time there, being filled up there, and then attempting these amazing things for Him in the world, living as His witness. Let's teach people that that's the way it's supposed to work. That we're supposed to rest and abide in Him. And from that place, the fruit comes and the Christian life emerges. We're connected. We're united. We share uh, this life with Jesus. And, and so we've got to learn to live in that place dependently, prayerfully, to breathe Him in so that we can live Him out. And we always start with Him rested with him desperate for him we should never move through a situation or a day where we go oh, i've done all this before i can no jesus please and from that place of abiding and resting his presence will make us fruitful in the world jesus is not out there somewhere his life is in us joined to us who believe fruitful productive, meaningful lives comes as we live out our connection to Jesus. For me, practically, I have to start the day here resting and abiding, knowing who He is and where He is and who He is to me so that I can move through this day with His power and His presence. If I want to start there, He's got to change my thinking every morning. Let's teach people that. Even in the calendar of your day, to make this the priority, that you abide first and live your whole day out of that. That has helped me immensely in my Christian experience. And, and what a, again, what a life this is. Not just about the doctrine, which is so important. Not just about the values, which are so true and important. Our discipleship includes all of that, and it includes this encounter, this sharing of the life of Jesus, <laughs> filling us so that we will bear fruit in the world branch to the vine. Let's call people to experience him. What can we share about Jesus, the true vine, with those who have yet to become followers of Jesus? And again, each of us ought to be continually asking God to, to show us the people in our lives where he is he's working on them. He's, he's speaking to them. He's calling them. He's convicting them. God, where's that happening around me? Who who? Can I enter into a conversation with, well, you're already ahead of me, God. You're working there. We should, we should be praying like that, and we should be praying for a list of people, asking God to do that work in their life. And from that position of prayer, then we're ready to share this incredible news about Jesus, and this news that he is the true vine, uh, has, it's, it's just got double depth to it, that he is God's one and only way to connect with him, and you actually connect with Him for life and strength and resource. So from that position of prayer, we're made ready to share. And this is gospel truth. Therefore, it has power. So speak it confidently, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Again, again I think questions are so important in conversation. Jesus used questions a lot. We should use them. So how about a question like this? What source or sources do you draw from to live a productive life? And listen. In other words, how, how do you make it? 
How are you making it in this world? Which is so full of chaos and uncertainty. How do you get up every day and do you? What do you draw from to get that done? And when they tell you and you listen respectfully because you respect them, then you can say what you discover. That through the Jesus who went to the cross for you, you have been reconciled to God. And He has made His home with you. And that's how you make it. You are connected to the God who can speak life into existence. It's okay to strut that a little bit if you want. (laughs) I know God. That's how I make it. And He's for you too. Like a branch to a vine. He's the source of all we need. He is the one source, the true vine. And we're to learn to live with Him like a branch to the vine and learn from Him how to live. And Jesus says about that kind of discipleship, that kind of intimate connection and dependency and shared life, He says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. When this week might you carve out some extra time just to sit down and savor this truth that He is the true vine and by His grace you're connected. (laughs) You're connected forever to life. And who will you share this amazing Jesus with? Let's pray and we'll sing to him. Father, thank you for all that you have revealed to us about who you are. Thank you that you've opened our eyes to see Jesus as the connection between you and us. Father, put in our hearts and minds the deepest of desires to want to be in Him, connected. Jesus, please exert your resurrected life in us for your glory and our joy in Jesus name amen let's stand together and sing the great and sure fulfillment 
the Lord upon the tree in this day of brooding sinners hangs the land victory see the price of our redemption see the Father's plan unfold bringing many sons to some measure love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could ever restrain him. Praise the Christ in power resurrected as we Well, thanks for coming out to worship Jesus today at Faith Community Church. And there will be, okay, we've got Hannah over here and Martha over there, uh, Hannah and Martha, they're there to pray with you about anything that's going on in your life. You don't have to try to follow Jesus, go through this life by yourself. Something that you want prayer about, then just move out to the front and these, these folks would love to pray with you there. If you're just checking out Faith Community Church, uh, want to know more about us, head out the back door over to the Connection Center. If you're brand new or never received our welcome gift, they have that for you. They can answer any questions you have about how to connect at Faith Community Church and, and what's going on there. Please take note of the bulletin you received when you came in, all kinds of stuff happening. Um, right now, uh, Christianity Explored is taking place on Saturday nights. Met last night for the first time, had a pretty good turnout, so don't be thinking you're that you're the only one that's going to come, because you won't be. There's already people that are coming, and it's a, it's a chance to, to learn or learn again some of the essentials of, of the Christian faith from the Gospel of Mark. This morning we talked about this amazing life of being connected to the God of the universe through Jesus Christ, Him living in you. And if you don't have that, but it, this morning it's been bumping around in your head saying, I want to know Jesus like that, through my sins forgiven and being reconciled to Him. If you want to talk about that, then don't head out the back, head right up to the front. Anybody that you see up here would love to have that conversation with you about how to be the branch connected to the vine forever, the life of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us, for this amazing life. Thank you that this life is so amazing that we will be living it forever with joy. Holy Spirit, fill us in such a way that your presence in us is obvious to people around us. Give us favor and give us power as we represent Jesus and speak of him this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.